Hello, and welcome back. I'm so glad you came back. I have a little opening music now, made for me by my son-in-law, by my request, and I love it. I love it. I hope you love it too. Today we'll be making a rainbow snake. You could call it a chakra snake, or um, use other colors. I was wondering how good it would look with Russian serpentine. It's like a lizard skin kind of look. That might be pretty cool. But anyway, you're going to need a lot of tiny stones. A lot of them. The second half of this video is me just fumbling trying to show you how I put the head on. So please excuse the less than perfect fumbling. Our Wikipedia article today is just titled Snake. So it's you know, all about snake. It's uh, more than one, but it's just called Snake. Anyways, not for me to judge. Let's get started. Snake. Snakes are elongated, limbless, carnivorous reptiles of the suborder Serpentis. Like other squamates, snakes are ectothermic amniote vertebrates covered in overlapping scales. Many species of snakes have skulls with several more joints than their lizard ancestors, enabling them to swallow prey much larger than their heads with their highly mobile jaws. To accommodate their narrow bodies, snakes' paired organs, such as kidneys, appear one in front of the other instead of side by side, and most have only one functioning lung. Some species retain a pelvic girdle with a pair of vestigial claws on either side of the cloaca. Lizards have evolved elongated bodies without limbs or with greatly reduced limbs about 25 times independently via convergent evolution, leading to many lineages of legless lizards. These resemble snakes, but several common groups of legless lizards have eyelids and external ears which snakes lack although this rule is not universal. Living snakes are found on every continent except Antarctica and on most smaller land masses. Exceptions include some large islands such as Ireland, Iceland, Greenland, and the Hawaiian archipelago. I had no idea that Hawaii didn't have snakes. Hmm. And the islands of New Zealand as well as many small islands of the Atlantic and Central Pacific Oceans. Additionally, sea snakes are widespread throughout the Indian and Pacific Oceans. More than 20 families are currently recognized, comprising about 520 genera and about 3,900 species. They range in size from the tiny 10.4 centimeter long 4.1 inch Barbados thread snake to the reticulated python of 6.95 meters, 22.8 feet in length. The fossil species, Titanoboa. Serajonisis was 12.8 meters, 42 feet long. Snakes are thought to have evolved from either burrowing or aquatic lizards, perhaps during the Jurassic period, with the earliest known fossils dating to between 143 and 167 million years ago. The diversity of modern snakes appeared during the Paleocene era. Nope, Paleocene epoch. 66 to 56 million years ago, after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event. The oldest preserved description of snakes can be found in the Brooklyn Papyrus. Most species of snake are non venomous, and those that have venom use it primarily to kill and subdue prey rather than for self defense. Some possess venom that is potent enough to cause painful injury or death to humans. Non-venomous snakes either swallow their prey alive or kill by constriction. Entomology. The English word snake comes from Old English snaka, itself from Proto-Germanic snakan, Germanic snake, ring snake, Swedish snak, grass snake, from Proto-Indo-European root snigo, to crawl or to creep, which also gave sneak as well as the Sanskrit naga snake. The word ousted adder as adder went on to narrow in meaning. Though in English, nedre, nedre was the general word for snake. The other term, serpent, is from French, ultimately from Indo-European serp, 
to creep, which also gave ancient Greek her herpo I crawl. Evolution. Please bear with me on some of the pronunciations in here, because these are some crazy words. The fossil record of snakes is relatively poor because snake skeletons are typically small and fragile, making fossilization uncommon. Fossils readily identifiable as snakes, though often retaining hind limbs, first appear in the fossil record during the Cretaceous period. The earliest known true snake fossils, members of the crown group Serpentis, come from the marine simoleophids, Sim simoleophids, the oldest of which is the late Cretaceous Cinnamanian Age, Hasiophis terrasanctus, dated to between 112 and 94 million years old. Based on comparative anatomy, there is consensus that snakes descended from lizards. Pythons and boas, primitive groups among modern snakes, have vestigial hind limbs, tiny clawed digits known as anal spurs, which are used to grasp during mating. The families Leptoflopidae and Typhlopidae also possesses remnants from the pelvic girdle, appearing as horny projections when visible. Front limbs are non-existent in all known snakes. This is caused by the evolution of the Hox genes, controlling limb morphogenesis. The axial skeleton of the snake's common ancestor, like most other tetrapods, had regional specializations consisting of cervical neck, thoracic chest, lumbar lower back, sacral pelvic, and caudal tail vertebrae. Early in snake evolution, the Hox gene expression in the axial skeleton responsible for the development of the thorax became dominant. As a result, the vertebrae anterior to the hind limb buds, when present, all have the same thoracic-like identity. In other words, most of the snake skeleton is extremely ex extended thorax. Ribs are found exclusively in the thoracic vertebrae. Neck Lumbar and pelvic vertebrae are very reduced in number. Only two to ten lumbar and pelvic vertebrae are present, while only a short tail remains of the caudal vertebrae. However, the tail is still long enough to be an important use in many species, and is modified in some aquatic and tree dwelling species. Many modern snake groups originated during the Paleocene, alongside the adaptive radiation of mammals following the extinction of non avian dinosaurs. The expansion of grasslands in North America also led to an explosion among snakes. Previously, snakes were a minor component of the North American fauna, but during the Miocene, the number of species and their prevalence increased dramatically with the first appearance of vipers and elipids in North America and the significant diversification of colubridae. Origins there is fossil evidence to suggest that snakes may have evolved from burrowing lizards during the Cretaceous period. An early fossil snake relative, Najaj rianagrina, was a two-legged burrowing animal with a sacrum and was fully terrestrial. One extant analog of these putative ancestors is the Earless monitor Lanthanthus of Borneo, though it is also semi-aquatic. Subterranean species evolved bodies streamlined for burrowing and eventually lost their limbs. According to this hypothesis, features such as the transparent fused eyelids and loss of the external ears evolved to cope with fossorial difficulties, such as scratched corneas and dirt in the ears. Some primitive snakes are known to have possessed hind limbs, but their pelvic bones lacked a direct connection to the vertebrae. These include fossil species like Hasiophis, Pacarharat, mm -hmm, yep, and Eupodophis, which are slightly older than Najash. This hypothesis was strengthened in 2015 by the discovery of a 113 million year old fossil of a four legged snake in Brazil that has been named Tetrapodophis amplectus. It has many snake-like features, is adapted for burrowing, 
and its stomach indicates that it was preying on other animals. It is currently uncertain if Tetrapodophis is a snake or another species in the squamate order, as a, as a snake-like body has independently evolved at least 26 times. Tetrodidophis does not have distinctive snake-like features in its spine and skull. A study in 2021 places the animal in a group of extinct marine lizards from the Cretaceous period known as Dolichosaurus. Dolichosaurus, and not directly related to snakes. An alternative hypothesis, based on morphology, suggests the ancestors of snakes were related to mosasaurs, extinct aquatic reptiles from the Cretaceous, forming the clade Pythonomorpha. According to this hypothesis, diffused transparent eyelids of snakes are thought to have evolved to combat marine conditions, and the external ears were lost through disuse in an aquatic environment. This ultimately led to an animal similar to today's sea snakes. In the late Cretaceous, snakes recolonized land and continued to diversify into today's snakes. Fossilized snake remains are known from early late Cretaceous marine sediments, which is consistent with this hypothesis, particularly so as they are older than the terrestrial Najash Rionogrina. Similar skull structures, reduced or absent limbs, and other anatomical features found in both mosasaurs and snakes lead to a positive cladistical correlation, although some of these features are shared with varanids. Genetic studies in recent years have indicated snakes are not as closely related to monitor lizards as we once believed, and therefore not to mosasaurs, the proposed ancestor in the aquatic scenario of their evolution. However, more evidence links mosasaurs to snakes than to varanids. Fragmented remains found from the Jurassic and early Cretaceous indicate deeper fossil records for these groups, which may potentially refute either hypothesis. In 2016, two studies reported that limb loss is in snakes is associated with DNA mutations in the zone of polarizing activity regulatory sequences, a regulatory region of the sonic hedgehog gene, which is, that's a real thing, the sonic hedgehog gene, I looked it up which is critically required for limb development. More advanced snakes have no remnants of limbs, but basal snakes such as pythons and boas do have traces of highly reduced vestigial hind limbs. Python embryos even have fully developed hind limb buds, but their late development is stopped by the DNA mutations in the ZRS. There's a section here now on tax taxonomy and families, but I think that this would be an extremely boring read, and there's tables here and you know, charts and graphs. You can go check it out on the snakes page on Wikipedia if you're that interested in all the lineage and all the names and varieties and species and families and genre and common names, etc., etc. We're going to move on to something a little more interesting. Legless lizards. While snakes are limbless reptiles evolved from lizards, there are many other species of lizards that have lost their limbs independently, but which superficially look similar to snakes. These include the slow worm and glass snake. Other serpentine tetrapods that are unrelated to snakes include Caecilians, amphibians, Amphisabanians, near lizard squamates, and the extinct isopods that are amphibians. Biology. We'll be starting with size. The now extinct Titanoboa was 12.8 meters, 42 feet in length. By comparison, the largest extant snakes are the reticulated python, measuring about 6.95 meters, or 22.8 feet long. The green anaconda, which measures about 5.21 meters, 17.1 feet long, and is considered the heaviest snake on Earth at 97.5 kilograms, 215 pounds. At the other end of the scale, the smallest ectum snake, 
is the leptophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophyllophy
molting or ecdysis serves a number of purposes. Firstly, the old and worn skin is replaced, and secondly, it helps get rid of parasites such as mites and ticks. Renewal of the skin by molting supposedly allows growth in some animals such as insects, but this has been disputed in the case of snakes. Molting occurs periodically throughout the life of a snake. Before each molt, the snake stops eating and often hides or moves to a safe place. Just before shedding, the skin becomes dull and dry looking, and the snake's eyes turn cloudy or blue colored. The inner surface of the old skin liquefies, causing it to separate from the new skin beneath it. After a few days, the eyes become clear and the snake crawls out of its old skin, which splits close to the snake's mouth. The snake rubs its body against rough surfaces to aid in the shedding of its old skin. In many cases, the cast skin peels backward over the body, from the head to the tail in one piece, like pulling a sock off inside out, revealing a new, larger, brighter layer of skin which has formed underneath. A young snake that is still growing may shed its skin up to four times a year, but an older snake may shed only once or twice a year. The discarded skin carries a perfect imprint of the scale pattern, so it's usually possible to identify the snake from the cast skin if it is reasonably intact. This periodic renewal has led to the snake being a symbol of healing and medicine as pictured in the Rod of Asclepius. Scale counts can sometimes be used to identify the sex of a snake when the species is not distinctly sexually dimorphic. A probe is fully inserted in the cloaca, marked at the point where it stops, then removed and measured against the subcaudal scales. The scalation count determines whether the snake is male or female, as the hemipenes of a male will probe to a different depth, usually longer, than the cloaca of a female. A skeleton. The skeleton of most snakes consists of solely the skull, hyoid, vertebral column, and ribs, though henophibian snakes retain vestiges of the pelvis and rear limbs. The skull consists of a solid and complete neurocranium to which many of the other bones are only loosely attached, particularly the highly mobile jaw bones, which facilitate manipulation and ingestion of large prey items. The left and right sides of the lower jaw are joined together only by a flexible ligament at the anterior tips, allowing them to separate widely, and the posterior end of the lower jaw bones articulate with a quadrate bone, allowing further mobility. The mandible and quadrate bones can pick up ground-borne vibrations because the sides of the lower jaw can move independently of one another. A snake resting its jaw on the surface has a sensitive stereoauditory perception used for detecting the position of prey. The jaw quadrate stapes pathway is capable of detecting vibrations on the angstrom scale, despite the absence of an outer ear and the lack of an impedance matching mechanism provided by the ossicles and other vertebrates, receiving vibrations from the air. The hyoid is a small bone located posterior and ventral to the skull in the neck region, which serves as an attachment for the muscle of the snake's tongue, as it does in all other tetrapods. The vertebral column consists of between 200 and 400 vertebrae, or sometimes more. The body vertebrae each have two ribs articulating with them. The tail vertebrae are commonly few in number, often less than 20% of the total, and lack ribs. The vertebrae have pro projections that allow for strong muscle attachment, enabling locomotion without limbs. Caudal anatomy, a feature found in some lizards, is absent in most snakes. In the rare cases when it does exist in a snake, caudal anatomy is intervertebral, meaning the separation of adjacent vertebrae unlike that in the lizards, which is introvertebral, i.e. the break happens along the predefined fracture plane present on the vertebrae. What they're talking about there is just with uh, some lizards, if you try and grab them by the tail, their, their tails will detach. In some snakes, most notably boas and pythons, there are vestigials of the hind limbs in the form of a pair of pelvic spurs. These small claw-like protrusions on each side of the cloaca are the external portion of the vestigial hind limb skeleton, which includes the remains of an ilium and femur. 
Snakes are poly. Who? Snakes are polyphiodonts. Polyphiodonts with teeth that are continuously replaced. I wish I had teeth that were continuously replaced. Internal organs. Snakes and other reptiles have a three-chambered heart that controls the circulatory system via the left and right atrium and one ventricle. Internally, the ventricle is divided into three interconnected cavities. The cavum arteriosum, the cavum pulmonal, and the cavum venosum. The cavum venosum receives deoxygenated blood from the right atrium, and the cavum arteriosum receives oxygenated blood from the left atrium. Located beneath the cavum venosum is the cavum pulmonal, which pumps blood to the pulmonary trunk. The snake's heart is encased in a sac, called the pericardium, located in the bifurcation of the bronchi. The heart is able to move around owing to the lack of a diaphragm. This adjustment protects the heart from potential damage when a large ingested prey is passing through the esophagus. The spleen is attached to the gallbladder and pancreas and filters the blood. The thymus, located in the fatty tissues above the heart, is responsible for the generation of immune cells in the blood. The cardiovascular system of snakes is unique for the presence of the renal portal system in which the blood from the snake's tail passes through the kidneys before returning to the heart. The vestigial left lung is often small or sometimes even absent, as snakes' tubular bodies require all of their organs to be long and thin. In the majority of species, only one lung is functional. This lung contains the vascularized anterior portion and posterior portion that does not function in gas exchange. This saccular lung is used for hydrostatic purposes to adjust buoyancy in some aquatic snakes, and its function remains unknown in terrestrial species. Many organs that are paired, such as kidneys or reproductive organs, are staggered within the body, one located ahead of the other. Snakes have no lymph nodes. Venom. Cobras, vipers, and closely related species use venom to immobilize, injure, or kill their prey. Venom is modified saliva delivered through fangs. The fangs of advanced venomous snakes, like viperids, and elipids are hollow, allowing venom to be injected more effectively, and the fangs of rear fang snakes, such as the boom slang, simply have a groove in the posterior edge to channel venom into the wound. Snake venoms are often prey-specific, and their role as self-defense is secondary. Venom, like all salivary secretions, is a predigestant that initiates the breakdown of food into soluble compounds facilitating proper digestion. Even non-venomous snake bites, like any animal bite, can cause tissue damage. Certain birds, mammals, and other snakes, such as the king snake, that prey on venomous snakes have developed resistance and even immunity to certain venoms. Venomous snakes include three families of snakes and do not constitute a formal taxonomic classification group. The colloquial term, poisonous snake, is generally an incorrect label for snakes. A poison is inhaled or ingested, whereas venom produced by snakes is injected into its victim via fangs. There are, however, two exceptions. Rhabdophis sequesters toxins from the toads it eats, then secretes that from nuchal glands to ward off predators, and a small, unusual population of garter snakes in the U.S. state of Oregon retains enough, t enough toxins in the livers from ingested newts to be effectively poisonous to small local predators. Snake venoms are complex mixtures of proteins and are stored in venom glands at the back of the head. In all venomous snakes, these glands open through ducts into the grooved or hollow teeth in the upper jaw. The proteins can potentially be a mix of neurotoxins, which attacks the nervous system, hemotoxins, which attacks the circulatory system, and cytotoxins or bung bungarotoxins, and many other toxins that affect the body in different ways. Almost all snake venom contains hyaluronidase, an enzyme that ensures rapid diffusion of the venom. Venomous snakes that use hemotoxins usually have fangs in the front of their mouths, making it easier for them to inject the venom into their victims.
Some snakes that use neurotoxins, such as the mangrove snake, have fangs in the back of their mouths, with the fangs curled backwards. This makes it difficult both for the snake to use its venom and for scientists to melt them. Elipids, however, such as cobras and crates, are proterogliphus, which possess hollow fangs that cannot be erected towards the front of their mouth and cannot stab like a viper. They must actually bite the victim. It has been suggested that all snakes may be venomous, venomous to a certain degree, with harmless snakes having weak venom and no fangs. According to this theory, most snakes that are labeled non-venomous would be considered harmless because they either lack a venom delivery method or are incapable of delivering enough to endanger a human. The theory postulates that snakes may have evolved from a common lizard ancestor that was venomous, and also that venomous lizards like the Gila monster, bearded lizard, and monitor lizards, and now extinct mosasaurs may have derived from the same common ancestor. They share this venom clade with various other saurian species. Reproduction. Although a wide range of reproduction modes are used by snakes, all employ internal fertilization. This is accomplished by means of a paired forked hemipenes, which are stored inverted in the male's tail. The hemipenes are often grooved, hooked, or spined designed to grip the walls of the female's cloaca. Most species of snakes lay eggs, which they abandon shortly after laying. However, a few species, such as the king cobra, construct nests and, st and stay in the vicinity of the hatchlings after incubation. Mo most pythons coil around their egg clutches and remain with them until they hatch. A female python will not leave the eggs, except to occasionally bask in the sun or drink water. She will even shiver to generate heat to incubate the eggs. Some species of snakes are oviviporous and retain the eggs within the bodies until they are almost ready to hatch. Several species of snake, such as the boa constrictor and green anaconda, are fully viviporous, nourishing their young through a placenta as well as a yolk sac. This is highly unusual among reptiles and normally found in requiem sharks or placental mammals. Retention of eggs and live birth are most often associated with colder environments. Sexual selection in snakes is demonstrated by the 3,000 species that each use different tactics to, in acquiring mates. Ritual combat between males for the females that they want to mate with includes topping, a behavior exhibited by most viperids in which one male will twist around and vertically elevated forebody of its opponent and force it downward. It is common for neck biting to occur while the snakes are entwined. Facultative Parthenogenesis Parthenogenesis is a natural form of reproduction in which growth and development of embryos occurs without fertilization. Agisgastrodon contraxis copperhead and the cottonmouth can reproduce by faculative parthenogenesis, meaning that they are capable of switching from a sexual mode of reproduction to an asexual mode. The most likely type of parthenogenesis to occur is automixis, with terminal fusion, a process in which two terminal products from the same meiosis fuse to form a diploid zygote. This process leads to genome-wide homozygotism, expression for deterious recessive alleles, and often to developmental abnormalities. Both captive-born and wild-born copperheads and cottonmouths appear to be capable of this form of parthenogenesis. Reproduction in squamate reptiles is almost exclusively sexual. Males ordinarily have a ZZ pair of sex-determining chromosomes, and females a ZW pair. However, the Colombian rainbow boa can also reproduce by faculative parthenogenesis, resulting in production of a WW female progeny. The WW females are likely produced by terminal automixes. Winter dormancy. 
In regions where winters are too cold for snakes to tolerate while remaining active, local species will enter a period of brumation. Unlike hibernation, in which the dormant mammals are actually asleep, brumating reptiles are awake but inactive. Individual snakes may brumate in burrows, under rock piles, or inside fallen trees, or large numbers of snakes may clump together in hibernacula. I always wondered where snakes went in the winter. Feeding and diet. All snakes are strictly carnivorous, preying on small animals, including lizards, frogs, other snakes, small mammals, birds, eggs, fish, snails, worms, and insects. Snakes cannot bite or tear their food to pieces, so must swallow their prey whole. The eating habits of the snake are largely influenced by body size. Smaller snakes eat smaller prey. Juvenile pythons may start out feeding on lizards or mice and graduate to small deer and antelope as an adult, for example. The snake's jaw is a complex structure. Contrary to the popular belief that snakes can dislocate their jaws, they have an extremely flexible lower jaw, the two halves of which are not rigidly attached, and numerous other joints in the skull which allow the snake to open its mouth wide enough to swallow, swallow prey whole, even if it's larger in diameter than the snake itself. For example, the African egg-eating snake has flexible jaws adapted for eating eggs much larger than the diameter of its head. This snake has no teeth, but does have bony protrusions on the inside edge of its spine, which it is uses to break the shell when eating eggs. The majority of snakes eat a variety of prey animals, but there is some specialization in certain species. King cobras and Australian bandy bandy consume other snakes. Species of the family Peridae have more teeth on the right side of their mouth than the left, as they mostly prey on snails and shells, usually spiral clockwise. Well, that's interesting. Some snakes have venomous bite, which they use to kill prey before eating. Other snakes kill prey by constriction, while some swallow the prey when it's still alive. After eating, snakes become dormant to allow the process of digestion to take place. This is an intense activity, especially after consumption of large prey. In species that feed only sporadically, the entire intestine enters a reduced state between meals to consume, conserve energy. The digestive system is then upregulated to full capacity within 48 hours of prey consumption. Being ectothermic, the surrounding temperature plays an important role in the digestion process. The ideal temperature for snakes to digest food is 30C or 86F. There is a huge amount of metabolic energy involved in snakes' digestion. For example, the surface body temperature of the South American rattlesnake increases by as much as 1.2C or 2.2 Fahrenheit during the digestive process. If a snake is disturbed after having eaten recently, it will often regurgitate its prey to be able to escape the perceived threat. When undisturbed, the digestive process is highly efficient. The snake's digestive enzymes dissolve and absorb everything but the prey's hair, or feathers and claws, which are excreted along with waste. Hooding and spitting. Hooding, expansion of the neck area is a visual deterrent mostly seen in cobras, and is primarily controlled by rib muscles. Hooding be can be accompanied by spitting venom towards a threatening object and producing a specialized sound, hissing. Studies on captive cobras showed that 13 to 22 percent of the body length is raised during hooding. Locomotion. The lack of limbs does not impede the movement of snakes. They have developed several different modes of locomotion to deal with the particular environments. Unlike the gates of limbed animals, which form a continuum, each mode of snake locomotion is discrete and distinct from the others. Transition between modes are abrupt. Lateral undulation. Lateral undulation is the sole mode of aquatic locomotion and most common mode of terrestrial locomotion. It is the mode that the body of the snake alternately flexes to the left and right resulting in a series of rearward moving waves. While this movement appears rapid, snakes have rarely been documented moving faster than two body lengths per second, often much less. This mode of movement has the same net cost of transport, calories burned per meter moved, 
as running in lizards in the same mass. Terrestrial lateral undulation is the most common mode of terrestrial locomotion for most snake species. In this mode, the posteriorly moving waves push against contact points in the environment, such as rocks, twigs, irregularities in the soil, etc. Each of these environmental objects, in turn, generates a reaction force directed forward and towards the midline of the snake, resulting in forward thrust while the lateral components cancel out. The speed of this movement depends upon the density push points in the environment, with the medium density of about 8 along the snake's length being ideal. The wave speed is precisely the same as the snake speed, and as a result, every point in the snake's body follows the path of the point ahead of it, allowing snakes to move through very dense vegetation and small openings. When swimming, the waves become larger as they move down the snake's body, and the wave travels backwards faster than the snake moves forwards. Thrust is generally generated by pushing their body against the water, resulting in the observed slip. In spite of overall similarities, studies show that the pattern of muscle activation is different in aquatic versus terrestrial lateral undulation, which justifies calling them separate modes. All snakes can laterally undulate forward with backward moving waves, but only sea snakes can ha have been observed reversing the motion, moving backwards without forward moving waves. Sidewinding, most often employed by col colubroid snakes. When the snake must move in an environment that lacks irregularities to push against, such as slick mud flat or sand dune, sidewinding is a modified form of lateral undulation in which all the body segments oriented in one direction remain in contact with the ground while the other segments are lifted up resulting in a peculiar rolling motion. This mode of locomotion overcomes the slippery nature of sand or mud by pushing off with only static portions of the body thereby minimizing slipping. The static nature of the contact points can be shown from the tracks of sidewinding snakes which show each belly scale imprint without any smearing. This mode of locomotion has very low caloric cost, less than one third of the cost for lizards to move in the same distance. Contrary to popular belief, there is no evidence that sidewinding is associated with the sand being hot. Concertina in movement. When push points are absent, but there is not enough space to use sidewinding because of lateral constraints, such as in tunnels, Snakes rely on concertina locomotion. In this mode, the snake braces the posterior portion of the body against a tunnel or wall while the front of the snake extends and straightens. The front portion then flexes and forms an anchor point, and the posterior is straightened and pulled forwards. This mode of locomotion is slow and very demanding, up to seven times the cost of laterally undulating over the same distance. This high cost is due to the repeated stops and starts of portions of the body as well as the necessity of using active muscular effort to brace against the tunnel walls. Arboreal. The movement of snakes in arboreal habitats has only recently been studied. While on tree branches, snakes use several modes of locomotion depending on species and bark texture. In general, the snakes will use a modified form of the concertina locomotion on smooth branches but will laterally undulate if contact points are available. Snakes move faster on small branches and when contact points are present, in contrast to limbed animals, which do better on larger branches with little clutter. Gliding snakes of Southeast Asia launch themselves from branch tips, spreading their ribs and laterally undulating as they glide between trees. These snakes can perform a controlled glide for hundreds of feet depending upon launch altitude and can even turn in midair. Rectilinear, rectilinear locomotion. The slowest mode of snake locomotion is rectilinear locomotion, which is also the only one where the snake does not need to bend its body laterally, though it may do so when turning. In this mode, the belly scales are lifted and pulled forward before being placed down and the body pulled over them. Waves of movement and stasis pass pos posteriorly, resulting in a series of ripples in the skin. The ribs of the snake do not move in this mode of locomotion, and this method is often used 
by large pythons, boas, and vipers when stalking prey across the ground as the snake's movements are subtle and harder to detect by the prey in this manner. Interactions with humans Starting with bite Snakes do not ordinarily prey on humans unless startled or injured. Most snakes prefer to avoid contact and will not attack humans. With the exception of large constrictors, non-venomous snakes are not a threat to humans. The bite of a non-venomous snake is usually harmless. Their teeth are not adapted for tearing or inflicting deep puncture wounds, but rather grabbing and holding. Although the possibility of infection and tissue damage is present in the bite of a non-venomous snake. Venomous snakes present far greater, greater hazards to humans. The World Health Organization lists snake bites under the Other Neglected Conditions category. Documented deaths resulting from snake bites are uncommon. Non-fatal bites from venomous snakes may result in the need for an amputation of a limb or part thereof. Of the roughly 725 species of venomous snakes worldwide, only 250 are able to kill human with one bite. Australia averages only one fatal snake bite per year. In India, 250,000 snake bites are recorded in a single year, with as many as 50,000 recorded initial deaths. Holy cow. WHO estimates that on the order of 100,000 people die each year as a result of snake bites, and around three times as many amputations and other permanent disabilities are caused by snake bites annually. The treatment for a snake bite is variable as the bite itself. The most common and effective method is through antivenom, a serum made from the venom of the snake. Some antivenoms is species specific, while some is made for use with multiple species in mind. In the United States, for example, all species of venomous snakes are pit vipers, with the exception of the coral snake. To produce antivenom, a mixture of the venoms of the different species of rattlesnake, copperheads, cottonmouths, is injected into the body of a horse in ever-increasing dosages until the horse is immunized. The blood is then extracted from the immunized horse and the serum is separated and further purified and freeze-dried. It is reconstituted with sterile water and becomes antivenom. For this reason, people who are allergic to horses are more likely to suffer an allergic reaction to antivenom. Antivenom for the more dangerous species such as mambas, taipans, and cobras is made in a similar manner in India, South Africa, and Australia, although these antivenoms are species-specific. Snake Charmers In some parts of the world, especially in India, snake charming is a roadside show performed by a charmer. In such a show, the snake charmer carries a basket containing a snake that he seemingly charms by playing tunes with his flute-like musical instrument, to which the snake responds. The snake is, in fact, responding to the movement of the flute, not the sound it makes, as snakes lack external ears. The Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 in India technically prohibits snake charming on the grounds of reducing animal cruelty. Other types of snake charmers use a snake and mongoose show, where two animals have a mock fight. However, this is not very common, as the animals may be seriously injured or killed. Snake charming as a profession is dying out in India because of competition from modern forms of entertainment and, en and environmental laws prescribing the practice. Many Indians have never seen snake charming, and it is becoming a folk tale of the past. Trapping The Irulis tribe of Andhra Pradesh in Tamil Nadu in India have been hunter-gatherers in the hot, dry plains forest and have practiced the art of snake catching for generations. They have a vast knowledge of snakes in the field. They generally catch the snakes with the help of a simple stick. Earlier, the Arulas caught thousands of snakes for the snakeskin industry. After the complete ban of sna the snakeskin industry in India, the protection of all snakes under the Indian Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 they formed the Arulas Snake Catchers Cooperative and switched to catching snakes for removal of venom, releasing them in the wild after four extractions. The venom so collected is used for producing life-saving antivenom, biomedical research, and for other medicinal products. 
The Irulas are also known to eat some of the snakes they catch and are very useful in rat extermination in the villages. Despite the existence of snake charmers, there have also been professional snake catchers or wranglers. Modern day snake trapping involves herpetologists using a long stick with a V-shaped end. Some television show hosts like Bill Haas and Austin Stevens, Steve Irwin, and Jeff Corwin prefer to catch them using their bare hands. Consumption. Although snakes are not commonly thought of as food, their consumption is acceptable in some cultures and may even be considered a delicacy. Snake soup is popular in Cantonese cuisine, consumed by locals in the autumn to warm their bodies. Western cultures document the consumption of snakes only under extreme circumstances of hunger, with the exception of cooked rattlesnake meat, which is commonly consumed in Texas and parts of the Midwestern United States. In Asian countries such as China, Taiwan, Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Cambodia, drinking the blood of a snake, particularly the cobra, is believed to increase your sexual virility. When possible, the blood is drained while the cobra is still alive and is usually mixed with some form of liquor to improve the taste. The use of snakes and alcohol is accepted in some Asian countries. In such cases, one or more snakes are left to steep in a jar or container of liquor as this is claimed to make the liquor stronger, as well as more expensive. One example of this is the habu snake, which is sometimes placed in an Okinawan liquor habushu, also known as habu shake, habu sake. Snake wine is an alcoholic beverage produced by infusing whole snakes in rice wine and grain alcohol, first recorded as being consumed in China during the Western Zhu Dynasty. This drink is considered an important curative and is believed to reinvigorate the person according to traditional Chinese medicine. Snakes as pets. In the western world, some snakes are kept as pets, especially docile species such as the ball python and corn snake. To meet the demand, a captive breeding industry has developed. Snake breads in captivity are considered preferable to specimens caught in the wild and tend to make better pets. Compared with more traditional types of companion animals, snakes can be very low maintenance pets. They require minimal space, as most common species do not exceed 5 feet in length, and can be fed relatively infrequently, usually once every 5 to 14 days. Certain snakes have a lifespan of more than 40 years if given proper care. 